Well, let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, this little one chapter letter. It's right before the book of Revelation, the book of Jude. And I did want to welcome those who may be watching via the internet. I know we have a uh, one lady from down in Louisiana or Mississippi somewhere named Angela, I believe is her name, and she may be watching us this morning. And if you are Angela, blessings to you and anyone else that is watching, blessings to you as well. And then also we'd like to welcome those who may be visiting our church. And I'm not sure if we have any visitors this morning, but if you are a visitor, would you allow us the joy of just welcoming you uh, by having you stand. I'm not quite sure we have any visitors here this morning, so okay. Now we're going to call on those of you who've not been to church for a while. <laughs> and, and you're kind of like a visitor for the first... No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. It's good to see all, each and every one of you. Would you please stand with me this morning uh, here with the book of Jude? We're going to look at just one verse this morning one verse. It's in verse 20, and we're only going to look at a portion of this verse in verse 20, and let me read to you the part of the verse that we're going to look at. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Let me read it again. But you, of course, that's speaking to Christians, you're called beloved. And then here's the, the call of God, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God, and we ask now that you would open our eyes and give us spiritual understanding. And may the gifts of your spirit be in operation today, the gift of prophecy, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of exhortation, mercy, teaching, and so on, all through the classrooms where the children are being taught as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. When you look at verse 20, you'll notice the first word is a word of contrast or comparison with the people mentioned just previously, which starts in verse 17. He says, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk or conduct themselves according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual or soulish or worldly persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. The phrase not having the spirit would nail down the fact that they are not believers. The book of Romans chapter 8 indicates that a person who does not have the Holy Spirit living in them uh, is not a believer, and when a person places their faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within you. So then he says in verse 20, but you, beloved, so in, in contrast to these people who are worldly, so, uh, soulish people, they're unsaved, they cause divisions, but you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Now, before we get into um, expounding and explaining this verse, uh, it is the question is, why is it that Jude is directing his readers to do this? And the answer is found back in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. In verse 3, he says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you or encouraging you to contend earnestly 
uh, for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. And the reason for that exhortation is found in verse 4, for certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So in verse 3, he says, look, I was planning to write to you about some aspect of our common salvation, but he felt constrained or felt, ne felt it was necessary to change what he was going to write, and he then wrote exhorting the readers to do this, to contend earnestly for the faith. That little phrase, contend earnestly for the faith, which was once delivered to us, means to stand for the body of truth once for all given, not to be added to or subtracted from. So that's really the main exhortation in this book to you as a Christian, to stand for the truth. God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And the reason we need to stand for the truth or hold on to it is mentioned to us in verse 4, certain men have crept in unnoticed, they're ungodly men, and they're turning the grace of God into licentiousness or immoral activities, and they're denying the only Lord God, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. They're really denying the truthfulness of Christ. For example, these false teachers gave themselves over to sensuality, immorality, and they said, look, it doesn't really matter what you do. God loves people, and he wouldn't put you out of heaven for doing something that comes very naturally. He loves you. Well, he does love you. There is a heaven, but you can't get there unless you know Christ. And so we have to stand for the truth. And the apostle, the, the writer Jude, I keep wanting to call him an apostle, but he was really, uh, he's not even the half-brother of Jesus. He's the step-brother because uh, none of the other brothers had his DNA, really. And, and anyways, never mind, forget about that. Someone pointed that out to me last week. But what, what Jude did is he said, listen, let me show you what God has done with these kinds of people. And he gave examples from the past of judgment. Then he gave three specific examples of individuals, Cain, Korah, and Balaam, that God judged them. And then he gave this long description that includes about 17 specific, uh, real explicit characteristic descriptions of this, these ungodly people. And then he ends the letter by saying, now look, I've told you to contend earnestly. Now let me show you how you do that. How do you contend earnestly for the faith? Do you walk around with picket signs, etc.? You know, how do you do it? Well, the first thing he said was to remember that the apostles told you that there would be these kinds of scoffers and mockers in the last days. You know, one of the things that can happen to us as Christians is we see these things lived out before us, and it can really rock our world, and we can kind of lose our focus on Christ and be swayed into all kinds of other focuses and activities in light of what we see going on around us. And that's not what it means to contend for the faith. It means to hold your ground. And these things have been prophesied. This is no surprise. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. God has told it to us through the apostles and through the prophets that in the period known as the last time, those days leading up to the second coming of Christ, there would be mockers. And how you stand for the truth is by, first of all, remembering what was said. The second thing, and we touched on this last week, but through the week I really thought about uh, trying to help all of us understand what does it mean building 
beloved, building up yourselves. Look at look there with me, please. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Let me read it again. But you, so he's speaking directly to individual believers. He calls us beloved, which by the way means very dear to God or esteemed. So you are very, very dear to God. You are his child. And he says, but you beloved, building yourselves up. So he's speaking now of something that involves your cooperation with God, and it's called building yourselves up. Another way of understanding that is simply maturing in Christ or growing up in Christ. Uh, it literally means to build upon. It means to finish the structure of which the foundation has already been laid it means to give constant increase in Christian knowledge and in a life that is conformed according to that knowledge. So we begin by understanding that God has placed a foundation in your life. If you have come to Christ, if you are saved, you have a foundation laid in your life. Hold your hand here, please, and look with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In verse 11, verse 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. Paul says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me in verse 10, as a master builder, I have laid the foundation. He's speaking there about the Corinthians. And another builds on it. So uh, believers were building and another pastor was there now. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. So he's saying, be careful how you're building on the foundation that God has given you. And then he states it in verse 11 that you have a foundation. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. I remember when we built this building that it took so long to get the building going. They spent such a long time testing the soil and retesting the soil and retesting the soil and then they had to put water on it and then they had to tamp it down and put more water on it as I recall and they had to tamp it down and they did all this work then they put rebar in there and then they began to pour the cement and it had to cure and so on and so forth and you can tell I'm not very adept in the building let me tell you a cute little story one day we were in this in our conference room and we had the team of guys all around the table and all these plans and blueprints and these were all men in the trades who knew their business and I'm just Pastor Bob, don't, I'm a one string guy. And um, the, I said, well, what about if we do this? And no kidding, the entire group just turned and looked at me for a couple of seconds and then they just turned back and kept talking. <laughs> And, and at that moment, I had a revelation that I was not needed in that meeting, and so I left. But I, I did come out every day and look at the foundation, and I wondered, is it ever going to grow? And then finally the steel came here and the iron, and it began to grow. So a foundation is important. You, are, you, are, you have a foundation underneath you, and his name is Jesus Christ. You are founded upon Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So what Jude is saying, now that we understand we have a foundation, and by the way, the word foundation means the beginnings. So the beginning of your life in Christ was to receive Christ. But now he says, you beloved, building yourselves up. So it is a call to action. You, beloved, building yourselves up. God is calling you to this. He's calling you to grow. He's calling you to mature 
in your faith. So here's a few questions. How do you do that? How does a Christian really grow in their faith? How do you build yourself up? What does it really mean? Well, we've stated it means maturing, growing as a Christian. But again, how do you do it? What does maturity look like in the Christian? How do you know if somebody is maturing, if they are being built up, or how do you know if they're immature? What does immaturity look like? And we'll cover that again. But do you recall that we just looked at Acts chapter 2, verse 42? You don't need to turn there, but let me say in a very general, broad stroke, a Christian will grow if they follow those four principles found in Acts 2.42. If you continue in the Word of God, and by the way, growth is something that is both accomplished corporately and personally in your relationship with God. It's important that you sit underneath the teaching of the Word. These people in Acts 2.42, they were doing what you're doing. They were listening to the apostles teach them. That's why it's important for you to come to church and to be taught the Word of God. And I might add, it's helpful to be prepared to come to church and to not be frazzled and in a hurry trying to get here, but in your own heart on a Saturday, begin to prepare yourself to come to church and shoot up a few prayers and give a little thought to what is going to happen. And then when you come here, don't linger out in the hallways uh, while the singing is happening. Come in and ready yourself to participate. It'll help you to be ready to hear the Word of God. But they continued steadfastly, and it's interesting, I remember looking up those two words, continued and steadfastly. They both mean the same thing. They mean to continue steadfastly. It's very simple. They stuck with the apostles' doctrine. They kept hearing the apostles' doctrine and then fellowship or the sharing of our lives. And this is why it's important to be corporately involved in a church body because you can't fellowship with yourself. You can't share yourself with yourself. You need someone else to share your love to and care for them and share your life with. That person needs you. We need one another. Thus, it's important to be a part of a local body. And then, of course, uh, we talked about the Lord's Supper and then prayer, which is going to be one of the next things that Jude talks about, praying in the Holy Spirit. So next week, we'll look at that. But in a general sense... You grow by following the model there in Acts 2.42, those four things. I would add two more areas of life that are found in the first chapter of Acts at, at the end of the second chapter, and that would be being filled with the Holy Spirit and being involved in evangelism. So those six things, a Spirit-filled Christian who's underneath the Word of God, in fellowship, honoring Christ, talking to God, and participating in evangelism through the use of your funds, your help, your spiritual gifts, etc. That's a picture of the New Testament church. So when we talk about growing, it is prescribed to us by God. It's His prescription to us. If you're there in Jude and turn to the left back to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, God has really called us or prescribed Christian growth. In 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1, it says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, in other words, putting these sins out of your life, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now, these people weren't all necessarily newborn babes. Some were. But he's saying to everybody, act like a newborn babe. Desire the pure milk of the word. 
so that you can grow. And by the way, growth is not something that any of us ever reach the finish line until we get to heaven. So the most mature believer can continue to grow and grow and grow uh, in their life. And we'll show you that in just a little bit. So you can see that it is prescribed for us. And then in answering the question, well, what does uh, growth look like or maturity? Well, it's really a growing into being fruitful. We'll look at some verses in a few moments where Jesus says, I've appointed you to be fruitful. Now, uh, what does fruit look like? Um, turn with me to the book of James, please, to the left there, James chapter 5. And I'd like to show you five or six or seven characteristics of being fruitful. The first of those is found in James chapter 5, verse 7. Um, excuse me, that's not where I want to be. This is a bad moment for a pastor right here. This is a very, very bad moment. Mm, 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 mm. Well, I'll just have to give it to you by memory. Um, oh my, I, th I went over this a thousand times and I thought I had it. Well, the Bible speaks of... Um, Oh, it's chapter 3, verse 18. Now, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. The fruit of righteousness. That's speaking of right character, right character. And right character means that we are being as we ought to be. It's the state of being or condition that is acceptable to God. And so right character, by the way, produces right conduct. So when we talk about growing, it has to do, first of all, with our character. We say to people, boy, he's really a character. You know, usually we mean that in a kind of a funny way. But we also know that a person can have bad character or good character we know that a person can have character faults or they can have character strengths. But to grow in Christ means that wh whatever your character was, it's going to be growing as it ought to be. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So godly character is, is definitely one. And then to the left of James, the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, and this one will probably surprise you, but it is fruit. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, it says, Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So he's saying here that through Christ, we, sh we can continually offer the sacrifice of praise. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks. Like we were saying, regard, you know, living above the circumstances, regardless of what's going on, there are some unchangeable truths in our life. God has saved us. We always have that to be thankful for. And so when you thank God, imagine a human being who prior to their salvation never gave God a second thought except to say D-A-M-N at the end of it, I-T. But then you become a Christian and all of a sudden you're saying, well, thank you. Because you've, you've come into a relationship with him and you realize he, what he's done for you or what he's doing for you. And then you, as you begin to learn about his mercies are everlasting. He's the God who forgives from our one-year Bible reading this week in the Psalms. You say, thank you, God, for being so merciful. So when you thank God, not only good, righteous, growing character in the right way, but being thankful to God, that is fruit 
uh, God considers that fruit. And then if you'll look with me, please, to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. The book of Philippians, it's several books, quite a few books over, actually. It's just to the left of the book of Colossians and to the right of um, Ephesians, but Philippians chapter 4. So it's right character, it's thanking God, praising God. In, and then in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, actually it's... it's um, <laughs> these notes that they sent me are just bad. It's, it's verse 17. It's Philippians 4, 17. I think I was so excited, I just put down 4, 7. Notice what he says in verse 16, verse 15. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, he was a missionary, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So nobody supported Paul except the Philippians. For even in Thessalonica, when I was over there, you sent aid, finances, once and again for my necessities. They were caring for him. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. So your financial support of the ministry and of missionaries is considered fruit as well. And then if you go with me, please, to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. Galatians, chapter 5. This would be one that most of us might readily think about, and it's good to think about it, of course. Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22. This is another aspect of maturity. What does maturity look like? Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, period. The rest of those uh, adjectives there, those descriptions, uh, they, they're describing what love is. Love is peaceful, it's long-suffering, it's kind, it's good, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, self-control. But love, the love of God coming from God through our lives being demonstrated, that's fruit as well. And then also in Romans chapter 1, verse 13, and to the left. And have you noticed how I've been having us go in one direction? Have you noticed that? Well, you should be thankful. I mean, I'm trying to make it easy on you. I'm just kidding you. But I do find it helpful to do that. In verse 13, we see that participating in the winning of souls is considered fruit or evangelism. Verse 13. Now, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often planned to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as among other Gentiles. And he's implying there the salvation of people is considered fruit. So what does a maturing Christian look like? Well, first of all, you're called to mature, you're called to grow. You're called to be fruitful, and that fruit starts with a character development of being right with God. It involves the fruit of our lips, thanking Him, praising Him. It involves the giving of our finances to the support of God's work. Um, one other thing that I didn't include here, it's in Philippians chapter 1, verse 22. It is our service to God. In fact, let's look there because I want you to see it. Philippians chapter 1, verse 22. And hopefully this will be in the right place. Yeah, it is. How about that? <laughs> Philipp I don't get these notes from anybody, by the way. I mess them up myself. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 22. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. So your service to Christ is also considered fruit and then the winning of souls. And then look with me, please, to the Gospel of John very quickly, John chapter 15, because here we see the Lord Jesus' interest in your life 
as it relates to fruit. John 15 in verse 8. When you're growing and you're being fruitful, something is happening. And that something is found in verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. God is glorified through the growing Christian. People notice it. They're affected by your life. They see you changing. They see your character changing. They see you have a more grateful attitude. They see that you have a, uh, an interest in other people that you participate in serving God. You're known as a servant of God. And God is no doubt wanting to use you to impact their lives and to save them. You know, I have a neighbor, and um, he's been on my mind all week long, and so I, I took something over to his house last night to give it to him, and, and I was going to talk to him. He came on Easter morning, but he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't home. And I thought, how funny, you know, I've been kind of not wrestling with it, but just waiting. And, and I looked this morning as I drove off, he still isn't home. And when I left, I put it right there on the front mat, but I'll, I'll see him this afternoon. And I, and I want to, to befriend him and love him and hopefully he'll come to Christ. But, but when, when you are being fruitful, God is being glorified. And it also means that you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And then look in verse 16 of this chapter. Jesus said, you did not choose me. This whole thing of your relationship with him didn't start with you. It started with God. He chose to provide salvation. He, he chose to provide it. But I chose you and appointed you or ordained you that you should go and bear fruit. God wants you to bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So he wants you to continue being fruitful. And then notice that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Fruitful Christians tend to see more answers to prayer because they're growing in the grace and the knowledge of God and they know what God's will is, and they pray according to God's will. You could think of many examples of growth. Look in Luke, please, chapter 2 for a moment, at the Lord Jesus Christ when he was a little boy. Luke chapter 2. You may remember the boy Samuel. He grew. John the Baptist, we're told in uh, actually in Luke chapter 1, verse 80, we might as well look at him. Look in Luke 1, 80 concerning um, John the Baptist. It says, so the child grew and became strong in spirit. And then in Luke chapter 2, verse 40, speaking of Jesus, and the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then if you look in uh, 2 Thessalonians, please, 2 Thessalonians, that church, the first chapter of 2 Thessalonians, which is way over to the right, you know, there's nothing more that a pastor loves than to hear this sound. So you just, so if you don't know where things are in the Bible, just do this, okay? Because at a minimum, you're going to make me happy, and then you're going to impress people around you. They're going to think, man, that person really knows what they're doing. You'll notice we don't put stuff up here or up there, and, and I actually, it's not a sin if you use your device, but I think you should have your own Bible and learn where things are in the Bible. If you actually have a Bible, you'll learn, and you use one Bible, you'll learn where things are on the pages, and you'll be able to go to them a lot better than you could on your device. And if you're trying to share with somebody, you'll know where in the Bible to look for it. Are you with me? So turn those devices off. No, no, I'm just kidding. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, here Paul speaks of the whole church growing. Verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other. But again, how do you grow? Well, look very quickly in 1 Corinthians 13. 
1 Corinthians 13. We've really been describing what a Christian looks like when they're growing, but how do you grow? And here are some kind of uh, different approaches. 1 Corinthians 13, you put away childish things in verse 11. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Uh, you can think about, what does that mean in the life of a Christian? How, what, how would you explain that? I'll let you think about it. You can also, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, it's by cultivating an understanding mind and spirit. Cultivating an understanding mind and spirit. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20, he says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. So it's up to you and I to cultivate an understanding mind. And then also, and I'm just going to mention these now because of time, but it's by following the example of Christ. You know, that, that little phrase which was popular for a while, what would Christ do? That's a very good statement. What would Christ do if he was sitting down with you, looking at your bills and your income? What would Christ do if he was sitting with you and you're considering, should I make this decision? Is it the right one or is it the wrong one? What would Christ do with respect to the idea of serving God? I mean, you can look at all those things that are considered fruit. Would Jesus be thankful to God? Was Jesus involved in evangelism? So we should follow his example. Also, if you go to Hebrews again, by Hebrews chapter 5, please. Hebrews chapter 5, not only do we grow by putting away childish things and cultivating understanding and following the example of Christ, but in Hebrews 5, 14, by partaking in the deeper truths of the gospel. In verse 14, it says, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use or practice have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So you grow by uh, partaking in the deeper truths of God. You learn about them. In 1 John chapter 2, we don't need to turn there, but it's by overcoming temptation. He says, you, young men, you are strong because the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Well, what are some signs of immaturity? How do you, let's look at it from that perspective and we'll, uh, we'll conclude with this particular thought. There's a number of things I want to share with you in a very serious manner. What are the signs of an immature person? Number one, it would be the inability to receive strong teaching or doctrine. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, I'd like to feed you with meat, but I have to feed you with milk because you're not able to take meat. You know, you don't serve a steak or a piece of chicken to a newborn baby. They can't take it. The, the, the uh, Corinthians were babies. They, they remained babies in addition they were babies because they were carnal. They were dominated by their flesh. Carnal people can't take in strong doctrine. That's why a lot of people don't like to go to a church that teaches the Bible. Poor pastors who don't understand that can't figure it out. They're teaching away and people are going away. Well, they're just, they don't want the word of God. You know, yesterday, and I'm just please bear with me in my folly, not, not folly, but just bear with me. Well, I, never mind. I just looked around yesterday at some of the local churches online 
their recent messages. And um, one, one of them literally never opened the Bible, literally. And, and most of them referred to the Bible and told a bunch of stories. It's sad. There's nothing more that I love than to say when I get up here, would you please open your Bibles? Great communicators, these people, probably a better communicator than I am, but the Bible is the greatest communicator. And those poor people can't take solid, deeper truths of God. And, you know, it's like in physical life, you know, you don't keep feeding a person pablum. They're 34 years old, and here now, open your mouth. Another sign of immaturity is when you need a tutor. You don't understand something. Now, that's okay at a certain point in your life, but you should grow to the degree... Now, listen, every one of you, not just the pastors, you should grow to a certain degree where you are rooted and grounded in the faith and you've got a basic handle on how to tie your shoes, how to put your clothes on, how to brush your teeth, wash your face, clean yourself, comb your hair, get out, drive the car, go to work. You know, I mean, we, we grow. And biblically, you should get a good handle on the Word of God. Another sign of immaturity is instability in the faith. Uh, some doctrine, some wind of doctrine comes along and you're just taken up by it. It just, the wind tends to blow things in whatever direction it's blowing. And if you're unstable, you'll just, oh, did you read this latest book? I can't tell you. Please don't ever come to me and say, Pastor, here's this latest book. <laughs> you know, would you read it? No, I won't. Actually, I don't have time to begin with, even if it's a good book. But so many people are, they're babies and they read something and it's just pablum on steroids and they, they think it's the answer to everything. And then finally, a mark of instability is when you continue and you remain in the basic primary doctrines of the Bible and you never grow up and you never go on. Those are signs of instability. So the whole purpose of this teaching in this portion of Jude is designed to show you how do you contend for the faith? How do you stand up for the faith? Now that's assuming that you believe the faith is important because there are ungodly people who've come into the church and they're twisting it around. They're turning it around. So much so that churches some places don't even open the Bible. And they're all psychologically oriented. And they're great storytellers. That's not the example. When Christ was here, he sat down and he taught the Word of God. And when the apostles started their ministry, they taught the Word of God and they preached the Word of God. So the two things we've looked at of how does a Christian contend for the faith, how do you stand up for the faith? Well, first of all, don't be too shook up about all these false teachers. God said they'd be around. It's a sign of the last days. But secondly, you, you build yourself up on your most holy faith. That is, that is a divine gift of God that he's given you. And he himself is the foundation. And next week we'll learn about one of my most needy areas, and that's how do you pray? Because he says, praying in the Spirit. So we'll look at that next week, all right? God bless you guys. God bless you.